Hey everybody, this is Sean. And Alex. And we're the Dukes of Dice, and welcome to our brand new Dutchie video set. Yeah. Also, like most things on the podcast, didn't have much to do with this one. Well, the Ducal Wii. You yeah, know, yeah, Ducal Wii. Yeah. Helped with, I, there's, that I helped with there, and that. <laughs> that's my, that's the extent of my help. So, yeah, about a 1090. Okay. Kind of, you know, at least 10% of the work to provide you those boxes. Well, we're, we, again, we, the Ducal yeah, yeah. Wii, are going to be ramping up our video production in 2017. Yes. And so this is kind of our inaugural video of, of the new video production, which you're going to help a lot with, too. <laughs> At least not for the well, maybe not for the next four months, but uh, okay. But yeah, we figured this is off to a great start. We figure let's <laughs> let's break in the new set with the top ten, our top ten games of 2016, and what better time than the end of the year to look back at the awesome year in gaming reflect. that it was? Reflect to reflect exactly, exactly. Now we do this we do this a couple different ways because. Later in April, we usually do a revised list. Yes. And so this is kind of just a snapshot of, of where we are now. We haven't played every game out there. And this lets us kind of just... As as we play the games that we have so far, this is where we're at. And spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. This is an opinion. And it's based on exactly... Yeah, it's a snapshot in time. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So, if you're not familiar with who we are, again, we're the Dukes of Dice. If you want to subscribe to our channel below, that'd be great. And we also have an audio podcast that we produce every week, Alex. Did you yes. know that? Yes. Every week. You uh, do help with that. Though. I do help with that. Yeah, you sure do. Help. So, <laughs> well, um, so let's kind of jump into to, to some methodology here. What were you What were you looking at for your top for I, your top I looked 10? at the top ten games I enjoyed the most this past year in the order in which I enjoyed Okay. How, what system did you use? Uh, so, basically, I put on the games that I thought I was going to have. I made a big list of games that I, I knew for sure one way or the other might be on there, might not be on there. Was it a list of 11 games? Uh, no, there were more than that. Uh, and, and I would bold ones. I would knew were on there and put them on there as I as I realized it. I will tell you the top half of my list yeah. was pretty easy. Okay. The bottom through, half of my one list five. Yes, one through five. Sure. The bottom half of the list, six through ten, brutal. Okay. Brutal. Uh tough tough to kind of sort out what goes where and, and that feels much more changeable. The top of the list seems pretty locked in. Definitely the top three. Okay. So I had a list of eighteen games. Okay. That's what I oh, I came up with, and I kind of went through things that we'd reviewed, things that we played. I looked at the Board Game Geek list of 2016, all the, all the games that came out. And uh, I actually went to a website called Ch- Challenge, C-H-A-L-L-O-N-G-E, so uh-huh. like Challenge, but with an O. Yeah. And it sets up these tournaments. You could set up like a bracket-style tournament. I set up a round-robin tournament, 17 rounds okay. of every single game in my eight, top 18 yeah. pitted against one another. Nice. And it, and it spread out a ranking, and I kind of, I didn't actually make any adjustments because I'm like, yeah, that looks about right. Cool. So every step of the way, I had to make a choice. This game or this game. This game or this game. Nice. And uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Now, because we're doing this at the end of the year, we haven't obviously played every game. There are definitely some games that I have not played and I own, or I've maybe only played once. And so mm-hmm. I'm not comfortable putting them on my list, but... I feel like they should be mentioned as possible contenders come April. Yeah, come April, they may make it onto the list if you've gotten more plays of the game. Yeah. yeah. So, just real quick, I'm just going to list them off. Sure. Liberty or Death, the, the coin game from GMT. Star Wars Rebellion, which came out early in the year and is a shame, a travesty that I haven't played that yet. Okay. Shame, shame, shame. Uh, Mansion's Madness 2nd Edition. Inis, or Inish, technically is how it's pronounced. I uh, only got one play of that in. Honshu, got one play of that at mm-hmm. BGG Con. Mechs vs. Minions, I've only played that once. Codex uh, from Serling Games, I've only played that once. And Railroad Revolution from What's Your Game, I haven't played that, but I expect I'm going to, I might have a shot at, at being something I'd enjoy. So those are kind of my contenders. But not on, not, but not on there. Not in consideration. Mainly because of not enough plays. Correct. Or no, or, yeah. or not. No, no plays, period. So my not enough plays category, Junk Art, I gave some consideration to. Okay. I only got in one, one round of that. That definitely. Honshu, strong contender. Oh, yeah. King Domino uh, was another one that I considered, but just didn't get enough oh, plays in. I thought King Domino would have made it. Okay, but yeah. not only, the, only, only one plays. play. Okay. Only one okay. play. One play. Oh, all right. So... It's a hard game to get to the table all in <laughs> eight minutes. <laughs> I'll get in some more plays of it soon, but but for this for this list, didn't make it on okay. enough plays. Uh, and then I didn't play Star Wars Rebellion. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Might have a chance. Probably not for yeah, me. Yeah. We'll see. Sushi Go Party I own. Okay. I haven't played. I keep hearing amazing things about. Okay. But didn't didn't crack the list because I haven't actually played it. Uh, and then Tyrants of the Underdark 
Ooh. You've told me good things. Yeah, you might you might like it. If you like yeah. Clank, well, then you'll probably hey, like Hey, we'll, we'll get to Clank in a, in a bit here, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> okay. I mean, definitely. All right, so uh, I also had some honorable mentions. Yep. Again, I had a list of 18, but I'll just give you the, the 11, 12, 13. Mm-hmm. Ice Cool. Yeah. Which, oh, you know, nice. I love it. Cool. That's my go-to dexterity game, I think. Cool. I really enjoy Ice okay. Cool. Cry Havoc, which I'm surprised. I'm shocked and surprised, and it didn't make my top 10 based on where it was earlier in the year, okay. in my estimation. But I just didn't quite get there. And then also Thief's Market, which is a uh, Tasty Minstrel game right. from uh, one of our sponsors. But uh, I really enjoy the the bluffing and the, um, uh, the manipulation of the dice and, and stealing from other people. Uh, but so there, three very, very solid games that, uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty good. Three uh, that were just off the list for me. Uh, Captain Sonar, yeah. honorable mention. Uh, really good Big group game. Uh, you can play that one with eight players and should play it with eight players. Yes. Works really well. Stressful, but not to the level of stress that we've talked about with something like Space Cadets Dice Duel. Uh, really enjoyed that one. Cottage Garden, uh, just off the list. Oh, yeah. Okay, I thought that would have made that for Yeah, not quite. Uh, but but it was it was definitely one I thought about. Uh, nice Uve game. Do, does really well with that. Uh, expands on patchwork. I uh, still prefer patchwork, but but this does some cool things with with that model, and good job by Uve on that one. And then role player, just off the list. Okay, role player, enjoyed that one. That's one where you're building an RPG character uh, using rolled dice and trying to fit certain criteria. Enjoyed that one uh, in the number of plays. Uh, yeah, I don't know how many more times I'm going to get it back to the table, but I enjoyed it well enough to at least think about it for this list. We never played that together, did we? I don't think we did. I don't think we did. Okay, yeah. interesting. All right, well, let's jump into it. Our top ten of 2016. Number 10. Alright, my number 10, mainly because it's really fun to say, is Potion Explosion. Yeah. Okay. I thought this might be higher up, but I figured it'd be on your list. This is, this is cool mini or not game um, in the or not category. Simon now, I Simon. guess. Uh, whatever. Come on. Uh, come on. Come on. Uh, Potion Explosion. This is one that I first played at Dice Tower Con, and boy oh boy, it really grabbed me right off the bat. Uh, it's this uh, matching, sort of matching thing where you're pulling marbles out and then hoping other marbles connect and explode to help fulfill potions. Uh, it's a combo-tastic game. Pretty quick, reasonably easy to teach for what it is, and, and looks gorgeous on the table. Great components to this one. Uh, really enjoyed my plays of this one, and, and it's definitely a worthy thing on the top ten. Um, I, I'm just not sure how many more times I'm going to get it in. in terms of it, There's some oh. replayability there, sure, for sure. sure. Uh, but it wasn't one that I necessarily looked to go out and, and buy. Uh, although I did enjoy the game, and it certainly, I think, is worthy of the top ten. So, Potion Explosion, my number ten. All right. Well, my number ten is Beast for Odin mm. from Z-Man Games, Uwe Rosenberg. This is, of all of Uwe's games this year, this is the big box. This is the one that is uh, pretty heavy, literally, and in terms of game weight. This is taking a bunch of his different mechanics from a bunch of his different games and putting them all into one I was going to say concise package, but it's certainly, no. not, <laughs> certainly not concise. So you have the oh, Tetris man. style, the, the poly, polynomial, is that right? Polyomino. Polyomino, there you go. Come on. The polyomino uh, Tetris style tile placement that you have in Patchwork or you have in Cottage Garden. There is conversion of resources like you would have in Lahab. There's worker placement like you would have in Caverna or, or Agricola. And you are a Viking that is trying to hunt, who's trying to go out on raiding parties, who's trying to uh, smith equipment and, and various jewelry and things like that. And there's a little engine building to it, too, because the more you cover your board with the Tetris pieces, the more income you get and the more extra bonuses you get. And it is a very thinky game. It is a little overwhelming. There are like 60 action spaces mm. that you can yeah. choose from. And Visually, like, it is, it oh, is yeah. absolutely overwhelming. Yeah. And on top of it, there are four columns one that requires what the first column requires one worker, second column requires two workers, and three, four, and so on. And so you have to decide: okay, am I going to take this one big action? Because uh, you start off, I think, with six or seven, depending on if you're playing two player or more uh, of the workers, and you get more workers every turn, which is kind of kind of nice. So later on, you're able to do bigger and better actions more frequently and things like that. I really enjoyed this. I I'm kind of surprised it's only ten, but when I compared everything, that's where it, shake, it shook up. You did do a tournament. I did. I did. But kind of looking at the rest of my list, I, I kind of see why it's number 10. It belongs in my collection alongside all my other Uve games. And I, I own all of the all of the big ones. Sure. Except for Gates of Loyer. Okay. Um, but I think that I have enough other stuff in terms of Uve games that, um, that I'm happy to play 
other times. And so, yeah, this is a, a, a solid 10. Cool. All right, so that is Feast for Odin from Z-Man Games. Number nine. So you mentioned it earlier, Alex. My number nine is Roleplayer from Thunderworks right. Games, designed by Keith uh, Mateshka. And this is a crazy game. I was... I remember when this was on Kickstarter, it didn't sound interesting to me at the time, and then as I saw people get their Kickstarter fulfillment and pictures come in, it sounded more and more interesting. The entire concept of the game is building an RPG character. Yeah. That, that's it. And that's something I enjoy doing, too. So I'm surprised it didn't quite catch my interest at first. And what you're doing is you are drafting these different colored dice. You are taking all these dice to fill in your character sheet, which has the classic strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom... Charisma. Charisma. There we go. Come on now. I don't have the charisma to remember. No, charisma. you don't. Uh, I guess that'd be intelligence. Well, yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway. I'm not dealing with memory. Anyway. So as you fill these different things in, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get a target number on each of them, depending on your class. Right. And then the different colors are going to line up with um, with your backstory because you want to create a certain pattern. In addition, there are uh, there's an alignment that you have. So you've got your neutral good or, or whatever. And moving around this little marker on that can feed different action cards that right. you get. Or when you buy certain cards, you have to you have to move in a certain direction, which is additional bonus points. Really cool, thinky, I mean, thinkier than it looks. I mean, it's just a bunch of dice, it's your player boards, it's some cards, but it's some really difficult decisions. Do I want to make sure I get a certain total in dexterity so I get these points, but then I'm not going to have the right color uh, to match my backstory? And lots of cool combos. Lots of ways to manipulate the dice, because uh, when you take like a strength action, for example, it lets you flip any die in your in your board. So a six becomes a one or, or vice versa. Um, dexterity lets you re-roll. Uh, wisdom gives you an up or down of one. You Lots only have cool. so many actions in each of these two. That's right. the decision as well. Yeah. You're limited in how many times you can do each of these things. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of there's some cool decisions here for sure. So I've played this, I think, seven or eight times. I got in like four plays of this at BGG Con. Yeah. And this was one of the hot games yeah, at BGG Con. Yeah. And I I'm ready to play a bunch more of this. I really enjoyed it. So that's my number nine role player. All right. My number nine is another one that, that ended up being the hotness for a good chunk of time here. That's Clank. Yeah. Clank, uh, a thematic deck building adventure where you're kind of delving into dungeons, uh, building up your deck to try and sneak through areas, fight off critters as you go, uh, grab treasure, and then get out. And that's the trick with this one, is there's that timer that goes. Uh, that once someone gets out, that's going to trigger a very quick grab stuff and get out quick before you get smoked by the dragon. A uh, really cool, uh, kind of a bag building element where you're trying to avoid having your stuff get into the bag. Okay. Yeah. 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 I sense. mean, you're building a group bag. It's not a yeah. typical. You're building anyway. Uh, it. <laughs> uh, but it works thematically, and and it's w one of the better deck build. I like deck building for a purpose. Sure. My favorite game of all time, Baseball Highlights 2045. First mention in the video. Uh, Clank. We're doing, we're doing that over here too. Absolutely. Okay. Just check. Yeah. Go yeah, on. yeah. Go on. Tell me more. Well, about I, I mean, I am until I okay. you know, leave for yeah. several months. Uh, so yeah, that's that's my number nine clank. It 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 played well just about every time I did. There's multiple paths to victory, interesting decisions, and just generally a lot of fun. The theme really works for this one. Okay. Yeah, so that's clank, my number nine. Very cool. Number eight. Alright, my number eight. This is one that was up for a big time award. Didn't win. Uh, and I'm not surprised it didn't win. Imhotep is my number yeah. eight. Imhotep. Uh, this is a uh, I believe it was up for the Spiel des Jahr. Uh, and it was kind of the one that, that felt more like what an old Spiel des Jahr winner would have yeah, been. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Uh, I first got this one in at Dice Tower Con as well, and, and it really grabbed me. It's it's really fairly easy to teach, fairly simple in what's going on, but a lot of cool decisions. Do I reload here and, and hope this boat doesn't sail off and take this action I might need? Do I put this uh, first or third on the ship in order to maybe get a better spot in, um, in, in the, uh, the temple area? so that my, my stuff better connects, or if I do that, am I risking getting a better, a, a worse draft uh, in the market, in the, in the card area? Basically, you're, you're sailing these ships uh, to try and end up scoring the most points through a number of different ways, and it all works together here, but also teaches easily enough for, for your typical, I'm, I'm not saying it's gateway necessarily, hmm. but it's close. I'd call it gateway. It's close. Yeah, I'd call it gateway. Uh, it's certainly easy enough to teach. It works really well, and, and I had a lot of fun with it, not to mention there's the variability of, hey, you can flip it over and there's the A-side, B-side kind of thing. Right. Everything works really well with this one. This was my favorite of the of the three games in the Spiel category, um, even though I don't think it'll have as much of a long-lasting impact as Codenames will. Sure. 
So that's Emotep, my number eight. And my number three of those games in the category. Yeah, yeah fair enough. <laughs> All, right. All right. My number eight, we actually just reviewed in episode 123, Oracle of Delphi. Delphi. Oh, jeez. Delphi. Was it 123? Yeah, it doesn't surprise me that this is here, but... So this is... I'm a, just disappointed This is a, a tasty <laughs> minstrel game uh, designed by Stefan Feld, and... I, this was, you can hear more about it in the podcast that, that just released, but I've talked about how I don't like Pikmin Deliver, but I like Pikmin Deliver here. Um, I wasn't expecting to like this game because of that, and I do. It, it, it works well. There's the race to it, but it still felt like a fell to me. I've heard a lot of people say it doesn't, doesn't feel like a fell, and I just, I don't agree with that. It, it feels like it. The action selection is very reminiscent of fell. The manipulation, uh, the dice manipulation, luck mitigation is very reminiscent of fell, at least in my mind. Um... So yeah, it's it's a it's a pretty meaty race game, but it doesn't have doesn't have all of the trappings of say a Firefly or Merchants and Marauders, which which are a little more sandboxy. But at least they're they're pick and deliver elements. Um, but yeah, I really I really enjoyed this a lot more than I thought. It's in the top half of my Felds, hmm. which uh, and I and you were you were not a fan. No, yeah, you were you were not a fan because it has it has some hinky things in it to me. And we yeah. don't have, go listen to the podcast if you're curious about that. I yeah, I didn't have kind things to say. Well, what's interesting, and I mentioned this in the podcast, both Oracle of Delphi and um, and Feast for Odin, yeah. so two games in my top ten, both have a characteristic. Uh, dice rolling that you want to expect in mm. Euros designed by these guys. So, I mean, Fell does have dice rolling in his games, but it's not that kind of a Ameritrashy style where value matters. It's just it, sure. it determines what you can what you can get. Right. For the most part, there's some exceptions to the board board, but not but not really. Um, so it's just interesting that those both kind of came out in the same year. You wouldn't quite expect that from these guys. But uh, but it was good. I really like Oracle of Delphi. I'm I'm excited to play more and that's my number eight. Number seven. All right, my number seven, I expect this to be a crossover on your list. Okay. Is Capital Lux. Mm-hmm. A, mm-hmm, yes? yes oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah, confirming. Oh, well, you know it's, one of, I mean? it's one of the few sixes I handed out this year. All right. Oh, that's true. That's true. So I, uh, I gave this a five. You know, we have a, five, a six point rating system on our, on our podcast. So I gave this a five, which is a very good, very good score. Um, this is a pretty small card game. Card game uh, or deck of cards with some tokens, and that's about it. There's not much to it in terms of components. But it's a really interesting choice that you're making. Um, you're building out either the capital, which is a shared tableau, um, and when you build out to the capital, you're going to get some sort of bonus action based on what profession you play, or you build it to your, your hometown, which is going to help you with scoring. But the trick is that you need to have enough of a value in each profession out in the capital so that your hometown comes in under it uh, in, terms of, in terms of numeric value. And so it's an interesting, interesting decision of, well, I don't. I want to play it here for points, but if I play too many here, then it's going to go over that threshold, and I'm, I'm going to lose all of those things. And ultimately, at the end of the game, you're scoring the points on all of the cards that are remaining in your tableau. Interesting decisions of when do I take the action here that's going to let me steal a card from the capital and move to my hometown, or let me add a modifier, a hidden modifier that I get to see down to one of these professions. Lots, lots of interesting decisions. Um, a lot of game in this little tiny package. And I, I really enjoy it. So that's, uh, that's Capital Lux by Aporta Games, designed by Alif Svensson and Christian Amundsen Ushby. All right. My number seven game uh, is designed by a guy I named my fantasy board game team after. Ah. Alexander Fister, and it's Great Western oh, Trail. Oh, it made it. Okay. It did make it. And and maybe not so surprising, because I've enjoyed every play I've had of this. Yeah. Great Western Trail, uh, kind of a merry-go-round mechanic to this one, where you're, you're taking a number of laps through a board, a map that, that changes effectively as you build buildings, change the landscape. Um, and, and hazards come out, um, uh, Native American tribes come out, um, the forms of teepees. And this works on a number of levels. This is a heavier end Fister. But when everyone knows what they're doing, it flows really, really well. We're about to talk about this uh, either on the episode that just released uh, soon after this video came out. A ton of fun. Uh, a lot of different strategies to victory. You can go heavy building. You can try and build up your deck filled with cows and try and uh, ship those cows to further spots down the road. You can move your train down the line and try and claim stations and do well that way. A lot of uh, interesting paths to victory. It's an engine building game where you're building that engine cranking it and letting it run. And it works. It works really well. I, I enjoy the theme here. I know for some people there's some disconnects. It also doesn't hurt that there's Albuquerque and Santa Fe yeah, in yeah. the game. So uh, really well done by Alexander Pfister. He's one of the hottest designers out there. And, and I thought he did a great job with Great Western Trail. I have nothing to say about that right now. <laughs> okay, great. 
Number six. All right, my number six is by another hot designer, but one whose games I typically don't enjoy as much as the, the broader board gaming public, Eric Lang. Arcane Academy, number yeah. six on my list. Arcane Academy. And Kevin. And Kevin Wilson. Kevin Wilson. Yeah, I always forget Kevin Wilson. Sorry, Kevin. Uh, it is superb. I, I first, this one was very much under the radar, continues to be under the radar. Yeah. And really just hasn't gotten the love that I think it deserves. That's unfortunate. It's, it, a, really, it is it's un a really good game. It, it's one where you're, you're picking up tiles and building, uh, paths. It, it's fairly simple mechanically. Uh, you have two different resources. You have, uh, energy for spells and you have these crystals to, to buy items. Shards, as they're known in the game. And you are grabbing tiles and adding them to your board, activating those tiles, uh, on a turn or removing everything off of there. It works really well. It's simple mechanics, but with a good amount of depth, number of paths to victory. I've played it a ton, and I've enjoyed it just about every time I've played it. I've won in a number of different ways. It's combo-tastic. It doesn't overstay its welcome. It's a pretty quick game that plays very well, and, and, and yeah, scales decently. It works at a number of player counts. Uh, I really enjoyed Arcane Academy, and I wish more folks would, uh, would give this one a try if they haven't already. So that's Arcane Academy, my number six game. All right. My number six... Alex needs your help for this. Huh? Happy Salmon! My number six game. Can All you right. That? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, can you? What is your game of Dice Tower Con? It, it was. It kind of. It's, I'm surprised it's not higher, Sean. It seems, it seems odd to me that this makes my top 10. I mean, it's, it's a light party game. Design, uh, North, North Star Games is the publisher, designed by Ken Gruel and Quentin Weir. And this is just a really simple, stupid, fun game. You are trying to shed cards from your hand, everyone, or from your deck. Everyone has the same deck of what, 12 cards? Mm -hmm. 12 cards, yeah. And all you're trying to do is you're trying to match up with other people the card that you've drawn. And so it's, you know, big group, and you're just looking around. You need to high-five. So high-five, 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 woo! And then you throw the card down. Happy Salmon, woo! Uh, at fist, least three. At least, yeah, the fist bump, and then switch your room. I'm not doing the switch room. We're not doing the switch room, yeah. where you, you, you get up and move. You do that loud, you can do that silently. It is incredible because I can be dead on my feet, ready to go to sleep, ready to crash because I've been gaming all day, and this will re-energize me. Yeah. So I, I love this game, and it makes sense that it's here on my top ten. I'm glad it's on your list. All right. So that's my number six, Happy Salmon. Number five. All right. Well, we're in the bottom half now, Alex. Yep. Well, I mean, top half. I mean, depending on half. how you look at it. Yeah. Top well, half. I call it top half. Lower numerically, but higher in terms of praise. And, and I will say there there is a, a decent gap for me between six and five. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, my number five is Arkham Horror, the card game. The, mm. the new living card game that just came out from Fantasy Flight Games, designed by Nate French and Matthew Newman. <sighs> this game is so good, Alex. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited for you to try this, because I think that you're going to like it. As much as you like, say, Pathfinder, the adventure card game, yeah. I feel like you're going to enjoy this possibly more. I don't know that I enjoy this more than Pathfinder, the adventure card game, but I like this quite a bit. There is a very strong narrative hook. I mean, we talk mm -hmm. about theme and games, and we kind of make a distinguishing... Uh, we, we distinguish between narrative and, and theme. Yeah. And I know you really like when, when there's some narrative element that, that grabs you and yes. you're, tell, you're telling it your own story. Organically, if it comes up organically. organically. But this does such a great job of creating its own narrative hook through the scenario. And it feels like it's a, it's a mix of a card game and an RPG, much more so than... Um, than say Pathfinder does. Pathfinder does it mechanically, right? You've got the 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 difficulty checks, you're rolling the dice and you're leveling up your character. But as far as on the narrative side, it doesn't quite get there on its mm. own. Arkham Horror does. And so it's a living card game, so you're gonna be able to deck build. Your deck will get better over time, like like you it will in Pathfinder. And uh, it's it's really good. It's really hard. Yeah, but it's really good, and I'm uh, I'm excited to play more more of the scenarios that keep coming out. So that's my number five, Arkham Horror: The Living Card Game. My number five is probably one of the games that will be longest lasting from this year, and I think one that people will remember as a signature game of this year. Okay, and I am pretty sure it's uh, higher up on your list. Okay, Terraforming Mars. Yep, that's what I was going to guess. It, it's one of those games that I think the theme hooked people. Certainly, Mars is in the imagination of a lot of people, uh, but the mechanics. Did the trick as well. Sure. This is a game where you're trying to to uh, change the surface of, of Mars. You're trying to put out oceans. You're trying to increase the oxygen level. Uh, you're trying to increase the temperature and make Mars a livable place. It works really well thematically, but the card play here is great too. Uh, there's a lot of interesting decisions in terms of how you're paying for cards. 
uh, a lot of different paths to victory. You can go heavy energy and, and, and invest in heat. You can try and build up a number of cards. I had a game where I was pretty successful and actually got yeah. the planner achievement, which I've seen rarely happen, but it can happen. Uh, you could go green heavy, where you're trying to just build a number of gardens around the planet, or city heavy, or any number of other strategies involving pets, microbes, take your pick. This game has everything. And I think the only downside to it is I think it was let down a bit by the production. Right. right. And I think if the production stepped up a bit on this one, as, as some of the games further up on the list, or at least one of the games further up on the list, you might be talking about this as, as almost an all-timer. I think it got let down a little bit by that. But the gameplay itself is super solid, and I've enjoyed just about every play I've had of this. I really think it's remarkable just how many different ways there are to play it and how many different ways there are to win it and do well at this. So, Terraforming Mars, that's my number five. Number four. All right, my number four, Sean mentioned this one earlier, and I think for good reason. Capital Lux, uh, one of the few sixes I handed out this year. I love simple games, but with deep mechanics and interesting decisions, and this one fits the bill. Yeah, it's got that weird disc versus butter pat thing, but as Sean mentioned, there's this great decision that, that you come to, one, on uh, do I need to play this one for an action out there, or do I want to put it in front of me where it's potentially worth more points? Can I press my luck? Are the modifiers on each of these different uh, districts or different uh, categories of cards, are those modifiers going to completely screw me over or are they going to help me? Uh, what information does someone have at a different point? It plays really smoothly. It plays really well. Uh, and and I've, I've enjoyed this one a lot. It's, it's one that I, I'm still actively looking to pick up. Uh, and when I'm adding it to a collection, I don't buy nearly as many games as you do, Sean. Sure. When I'm buying a game, it's usually a pretty good sign. Yeah. So Capital Lux, really solid. Uh, especially on that on that uh, lighter end, uh, less play time, smaller yeah. table space card game kind of weight. Perfect game for this year. I loved it. All right. Lux. Well, my number four is Great Western Trail. You already mentioned it. Uh -huh. Alexander Fister, Stronghold Games. Um, yeah, this is a, a pretty another meaty game. Um, interesting Euro game. There's that you call it, call it a merry-go-round. Yeah, if you're you're going around these paths, right? It's a and, lap. Yeah, yeah, you're doing a lap. It's uh, some people kind of refer to it as similar to Kalos in that sense. And you're you are building an engine. There's some some deck building as you're trying to get uh, more diversified cattle and higher value cattle in your deck, so that once you complete the circuit and get to Kansas City, you can get more income and get farther along on on the track. And what I re well. You're, you, if you're listening to the podcast, you will have just heard our review of this. Yes. Uh, if not, then you can go back and, and listen to that in episode 124. But one of the things that I'm going to mention I like about this is that I like engine building, and I like the opportunity to let your engine run for a while mm -hmm. after you've kind of assembled it. And in a lot of games, you don't get to let it run a couple turns. And I've heard people complain that, well, um, the last couple turns are just repetitive. You're doing the same thing. And I kind of like that. I kind of like building that engine and then getting to actually play with it a bit. Right. And even doing the same thing over and over, I, I like seeing what I built and seeing how well I'm able to crank it out. Right. The fulfillment for me of, of, I went heavy ribbon, heavy building strategy last time. Yeah. The fulfillment of either being one card off, in, in my case, and, and not quite making it work, or getting my biggest building out there for the first time ever in that game and having that work. You have these, these moments of accomplishment, whether sure. you win or lose. So, yeah, I agree with you. I like it. All right. So that's my number four, Great Western Trail. Number three. All right. My number three, Terraforming Mars. Yeah. And since we reviewed it, uh, what, a couple weeks ago? Mm -hmm. I pretty much knew that there was going to be my number three game. I was pretty certain I knew what number one was going to be, number two, and then I played this and and after 10, 11, 12 plays, I'm like, yeah, this is it's not better than, than one and two, but it's going to probably be my number three game. And for all the things that you mentioned, I mean, I'm in complete agreement. There's its own bit of engine building, which is something that I like. It's a theme that I, that I enjoy. I've read science fiction books on that theme. And it's just really fun to see what can I do with the cards that are given to me, whether you're, you're drafting or not, but you should draft. <laughs> um, yes. What can I assemble out of this? That's going to uh, that's going to help me the most, and lots of interesting decisions. There's that great revving up of I'm, I'm building my income. Um, I, it's just it's so good, and I'm um, I'm happy to teach this game because I I don't think it's too difficult of a teach, and a lot of the things about it are so intuitive. Um, so it's I mean for example Great Western Trail it's a bear of a teach. Yeah, I mean a tremendous teach. This one seems a lot easier because there is a lot more intuitive. Uh, 
rules to it. And then on top of that, everything just kind of everything just kind of makes sense. It all boils down to something pretty simple, but really it's those card interactions that that add the the depth to play. So fantastic game. My number three, Terraforming Mars. All right, my number three, Sean, I need your help for this one. Happy salmon. So this <laughs> was that two or three? I, I was I I was it was, it was two and a half. Okay, fine. One, two, two three. three. Okay, there we go. All right. Uh, so my number three is Happy Salmon, and and Sean really really sold this well. My only summary to this one is it, it is gamer Viagra, in a good way. Uh, I guess that I don't know how that would be bad. I mean, it might be bad. It could be bad in weird situations. Anyway, I've talked myself into a corner. I'm gonna just go another. Anyway, uh, Happy Salmon. I, I have had more fun with this game than I think I've had with just about any other game I've played this year. Uh, it's one that's brought smiles to so many faces, uh, especially in convention settings, where it just draws people in. Uh, people want to try it. People want to play it. It's It comes in a, in a neoprene salmon pouch. Yeah. I mean, just from that alone. And, and the fact that I'm excited about the expansion, which is literally the same game, just different colored cards and a different colored fish... The fact that I'm that excited about it tells you a lot about this one. Uh, it's one I've I've seen go over so well with so many different people. Um, if you don't like this one, Matthew, <laughs> you are a grouch. You are a grouch and a curmudgeon, and you need to play it uh, to bring a smile to your face because that's what this game does. Uh, I, I love the joy it's brought, um, and and I'm really happy to have it in the collection because when the right number of players are around and the situation's perfect, that's the one. My favorite, one of my favorite memories of the year, by the way, <laughs> is you hip checking poor Anthony oh, into another table. Yeah. Well, that that and Trader Happy Salmon, the Trader yes. variant, demonstrated here because it actually works in a video. Hey, Sean, high five! Oh, oh, oh damn it! Oh. Yep. Oh, so heartbreaking. That's my number three, Happy Salmon. Number two. So, Alex, you're going to give our, give your two here in a second. Well, yeah, I, I said R2, because I'm pretty sure... It, it's the same thing. My number two is your number two. My number one is your number one. Which, Weird. Which um, says a lot. Well, so we, we had Matina in common last year. Uh, my, my one, your two. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we had that in common, and we can agree on some games sometimes. Uh, I think there's some, some decent crossover on this list. But yeah, top level, maybe not super surprising with these two. Because I think these two were were ones that just blew my mind in different ways. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about them. Okay. Uh, no, both of our number twos, Millennium Blades. Yep. Uh, it helps that it's a local Albuquerque company, Level Ninety Nine yep. Games. Uh, Brad and and the folks over there do great work. This is one that I wasn't gonna think I was going to enjoy, and you I, were, and you didn't think I would go I anywhere was near. Convinced this. you would hate this game. Absolutely convinced. And the truth of the matter is, with the sheer variety in cards. The the fun themes that I do connect with, sure. I don't connect with... The, so this is, uh, for folks who don't know, this is a CCG simulator. Yes. Uh, it's kind of doing the big metagame of a CCG. You're doing it in phases. You have this real-time phase where you're quickly swapping cards, paying money to the bank, buying booster packs, which look like booster packs. You're cracking They're packs great. of boosters. They it's, look so cool. Yeah. Uh, and, and basically assembling your deck. It's, it's basically a real-time deck building. Uh, done in a way where you can earn points through trading and, and, and building up sets and collections. That's one half of the game yeah. that works really well and is, is completely different than a lot of folks expect. Then there's where you're actually playing the cards out, uh, where you're trying to uh, fit the meta uh, setup of the tournament, trying to, to play cards that'll work there, and just accumulate the most points and do the best in that tournament. Right. And if you do the best there, you'll get a certain number of points for that. A and those two pieces of the game mesh beautifully. This game comes with so many cards, <laughs> all the cards in this yep. box, and they have an expansion, a, the set rotation expansion, uh, coming out for even more cards. Which I kickstarted. Set up on coming. set up on this one is a beast. It is, and there are some component questions for this with with this one. Don't get me wrong, but man, oh man, is this fun, and it plays unlike anything else. Yeah, um, really, it's it's a truly unique game truly fun game and one that I just wish I could get to the table more yeah. because of the ex kind of experience this provides. Well, and I actually expected a lot of people in our play group to be so-so on it. I mean, mm -hmm. not just you, but I thought, right. you know, as I taught this to people, I kind of undersold the game. Yeah. And I was just surprised how many people in our play group over at Empire Board Game Library really enjoyed it. Yeah. That, that they themselves didn't necessarily expect to enjoy it. They didn't have a CCG background. And so me coming from playing a ton of magic over the years, playing a bunch of other CCGs, playing a lot of competitive magic, 
I, I knew this was something I was going to enjoy. I played this when it was a prototype over at the Level 99 Studios, and I was like, oh, this is, this is really good. And uh, when, I, when we got the production copy from Brad, I, I just fell in love with it the first time. I mean, it is just, it is so good. It is difficult to get to the table for some reason, and I, I, I want to correct that. 2017, I'm going to play a ton of Millennium Blades with the new expansion, because it is just, it is so good. The, the whole real-time element of trying to, cr to build your collection, the trading, the opening booster packs, like, all, like you said, it feels like that. I've had times where I've gone into a local shop to play in a Magic tournament, and I'm, I'm looking around for, I need these three cards. I'm missing these three cards. Anyone have these? Can I, can I borrow? Can I trade? And so that frantic thing, because it's going to start in 20 minutes. The tournament's going to yeah. start. I got a sleeve and whatever. It, it kind of captures that in, in a nice way. And then the actual tournament play, it's, it's fairly straightforward. You play out, uh, it was eight cards. You play out eight cards in a certain order. The order you play them in is going to have some sort of effect. There are special abilities that are Six. triggered. Six? I think it's eight. Yeah, well, the screen is showing us now. It's up. It's right here. Research. See? No, the screen shows it right here. Oh, does it? Yeah. The screen that we that we put in post. Oh, hang on. I'm just so, gonna pull the rule book because we live in an era without mystery. Anyway, so that's my number two, Millennium Blades. Number one. All right. Well, our shared number one, Scythe. Yeah. Stonemaier Games, designed by Jamie Sigmeyer. Um, this was one, and, and I hear this, I'm hearing this so much right now. I'm hearing people that are saying either lived up to the hype or didn't live up to it. Now, keep in mind, I got to play this, uh, our buddy Matt over at Empire, he put together a print and play copy during the Kickstarter. So I actually had played it while it was, while the campaign was going, and I knew I really liked it. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed the mechanics, I really enjoyed the gameplay. So it wasn't necessarily that it lived up to the hype, it's just I, I got a chance to play it and... I like the finished product even better than Matt's print and play. Shocker, because the components are amazing. Gorgeous. The components are the the gold standard of of board gaming, yeah. I think. I mean Up there with Mechs versus Minions. Right. And, yeah. Right. It's just just fantastic. So this is kind of um a, a farming game with a little bit of warfare. A farming the simulator. Threat, the th <laughs> farming simulator. The little bit of the threat of warfare thrown in there. Um <laughs> Interesting action selection. You have a, a two-part player board that you'll have different combinations uh, through, uh, in different games. You have individual player powers. You select an action, and there's a top action and a bottom action. Next turn, you have to select a different action. And so interesting choices there. You're moving around the board. You're gathering your resources. You're building these mechs, which give you additional rule-breaking abilities. Um there's a race element to it because you're trying to not necessarily be the first to drop your six, but uh, your six stars or get your six objectives. Um, but that's usually a good sign that you're going to do well right. um, because then you have to worry about popularity. You have to worry about how many territories you're occupying. So many things to consider in this game. Um, I've heard complaints that the end kind of seems abrupt. Yeah. But I feel like if you're kind of paying attention and, and Realizing what everyone's capable of, you're kind of preparing for that. Very often, I, I'm saying to myself, okay, it's going to end in two turns. I've got two turns left. Right. Um, but there's just so many things about the game. There's there's a simple elegance to the action selection. Turns can, when, when people know what they're doing, turns can be fairly quick. There's something very satisfying about um, being able to get both the full effect of a top and a bottom action. Yeah. And when you can do that turn after turn after turn... Mm -hmm. Oh, you're in good shape. And it's really satisfying. Yeah. I love this game. I mean, it made both of our top 10 of all time lists. We, right. we redo those every year in August. Um, so, I mean, it was a no-brainer that it was going to be on my top 10. No-brainer that it was going to be my number one. Yeah. I mean, nothing nothing has come close to Insignia. No, in terms, in terms of the gaming experiences that I've had this year, uh, some of the most memorable ones I've had have been playing this game. And I think part of that is because there are so many different ways to win this, uh, much like Terraforming Mars. Uh, you can win without mechs. It seems crazy yeah. when you're learning the rules that you can you can go about this this game and win and do well without mechs. I did it. You yeah. can do it. It's yeah. it's doable with with the right faction or the right mindset. It's one that you don't necessarily go in uh, uh, to that. But if you're playing with the game, if you're if you're thinking about what's best in this situation, if you're driving towards a, a good strategy, you're going to find a lot of interesting ways to have success in this game. Uh, with the Underminer, uh, the different faction abilities are, are fascinating and how they work with the different boards 
and, and how they, they set up these interesting situations. Right. The Underminer can be kind of a late-game terror, just bullying players, especially on tunnels, and winning a ton of combats and dropping stars like crazy. But they might be slower in the early game. Uh, the, the Nordic Kingdoms, uh, with, that, with that swim ability, can set up nice board presence, create almost a wall of villagers that, that is going to be very costly to try and pierce uh, and take up territory that way. There are a ton of different, different things going on in this game in terms of how to play it. For me, it clicked from game one. Yeah. Uh, I have yet to lose it this one still. Yeah, yeah. Somehow, some way. Uh, I don't know why. It's not the type of game that I would typically gravitate towards and either. I, again, that's what's weird. I didn't think you were going to like this game. Yeah. I thought you'd be so-so on it. Sure. I didn't think you were going to hate it by, like Millennium Blades. Right. But I thought you'd be so-so on it. It sucked me in from a narrative perspective. Yeah. Because the art in this oh. game is absolutely stunning. The decisions on the encounter cards you have are have you, cool. Have you looked at the art book? Have you actually? Uh, I've not actually it? looked at the oh. art book. It's really cool. It's it's a it's a stunning, stunningly gorgeous game. Yeah. Uh, that that fits its theme well, uh, and I love the fact that 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 you can succeed at this one by putting farmers out there as as meat things shields. take meat shields effectively, <laughs> taking up space and, and taking up territory. That's a legitimate way to go about this in terms of of there's a positional element to this that, yeah. that I'm really hooked on. I like what the new expansion does with these non-island-bound factions out there. I'd like to play more with that. I've played it played it once so far. There's a ton going on in this game, and it's a world that I just like to be in. Sure. It certainly doesn't click for everyone, but boy, it really clicked for me. And not not just because I'm good at it, but because there's there's uh, cool mechanics, gorgeous theme, uh, and art uh, that that blends together into this perfect package. The components, everything. It's just a a, a Perfect tabletop experience, yeah. and it's high up on my top ten of all time for that reason. So I lost of my first three games. Yeah, I lost two of them. Okay. Since those, and then the third one was to you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, since those three games, mm -hmm. I played. I think at twelve. Well, twelve total, so nine since. Okay. I've been undefeated. Okay. In nine games. Yeah. yeah. Pretty sure. I'm reasonably certain. So before you leave, undefeated. Before you leave, uh -huh. of the nine, of the nine, okay. the, the the latter. Yeah. yeah anyway, yeah. we got to play. All right. We need to figure out how many players we want. Yeah. And who gets which factions? Oh, random, right? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, let you, I'll even let you have Roos Vietz. No, no, no. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need it. Okay. I don't need it. Right. I've won with every faction, Sean, except for the expansion ones because I haven't played with them. Okay. Just saying. All right. Uh, Boy, that'll be... Yeah, okay. All, All right. right. All right. All right, so let's talk about crossover. Yeah, yeah. Right? Obviously, Side of the Millennium Blades. Yep. Terraforming Mars. Yep. Great Western Trail. Happy Salmon. Happy Salmon. And Capital Lux. Yeah, that's six. six of the ten. Now, some of that, some of that is because we're playing a lot of the same games. Right, to review for the podcast. To review for the podcast, yep. right. Um, so, I mean, I, I still find that interesting. There were, there were some really solid games that came out this year. I Last year, I said 2015 was the year of the blockbuster, mm. because you had co-names, you, um, you had Pandemic Legacy... And but I still think Terraforming Mars and Scythe, especially, um, are going to have a huge impact on the hobby for, for years to come. Yes. Um, maybe not Millennium Blades as much. I mean, I'd like it to. Sure. Because I, I think it's fantastic. I think Arkham Horror as well. Um, so I, for me, this was a this was a pretty solid year. And then Star Wars Rebellion, which neither of us have played, but we have right. heard a ton of good things about. I mean, I'm, I, yeah, I look at my contenders, and I'm just like, wow, I, I really need to get on top of that. I'm curious what my list in April is going to look like. Um, because my top three are in pretty good shape. Yeah. Like, I don't see anything moving them off. By any sure, sure, sure. I mean, they're going to be there, um, and they're going to probably be in the top half. Uh, but who knows? Yeah. What did you think about 2016 as a whole? So, it, as, I was, as I was making my lists for 2015 and 2016, I had very different experiences with those lists. Mm -hmm. And I recall with the 2015 list, it was hard, oh, what am I going to leave off? And with this one, it was more of what am I going to put on. Interesting. There's some really good success at the top end of this. Scythe, uh, Millennium Blades, Happy Salmon for me is an, a, a classic. Uh, and Terraforming Mars, I think, is the one that's going to have the broader impact of, of the bunch. There's some really quality games. I just think 2015 was better. I just think 2015 had, had in terms of the quantity of good games and the top end, it helps that Baseball Highlights 2045 is that year. It helps that Matina is that year. And those are, for me, all-timers. But if I'm looking at my top 10 and stacking up against this top 10, I'm liking the top 10 of 2015 a lot better than the top 10 of 2016. And that's not to say, I don't think 2016 was a bad year, but I do think it, it didn't quite shine as bright as 2015 did. 
Okay. I couldn't tell you why. All right. All right. Well, that is our top 10 games of 2016. Really top, uh, what, 18 games or so with the... Uh, with the crossovers? Oh, with the crossovers, yeah. 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 Something like No, not even. Do, not do even. math. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, six, six, and then uh, 14, I think. Okay, okay. great. Yep. Thanks, Ray. Math. Thanks, Ray, man. You're welcome. So, <laughs> oh, yes, that was really hard. <laughs> so anyway, uh, thanks, for, thanks for tuning in for our kind of inaugural uh, relaunch of our, our YouTube channel. Yeah. And uh, again, if you're, if you're new to the Dukes of Dice, please go check out our, our weekly podcast. Subscribe below. Uh, there will be information at the bottom. Check us out on Twitter and Facebook and, and Instagram. Because Mariah will get upset if I don't mention Instagram and uh, and all that stuff. Cool. All right. So until next time, this is Sean. And Alex. We'll see you next time.